Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. We'll begin with our first hymn, Hymn 717. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. 
May God give you strength to live ac according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. wisdom to recognize the treasures you have stored up for us in heaven, that we may never despair but always rejoice and be thankful for the riches of your grace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. first lesson for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, reading into chapter 2. The words of Ecclesiastes, David's son, king in Jerusalem. Nothing but vapor, Ecclesiastes said, totally vapor. Everything is just vapor that vanishes. I, Ecclesiastes, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my heart to seek out and explore with wisdom everything done under the sky. What a burdensome task God has given the children of Adam to keep them busy. I have seen all the actions done under the sun, and look, it is all nothing but vapor. It is all chasing the wind. I also hated all the results of my hard work, for which I worked so hard under the sun, since I must leave it all to the man who comes after me. And who knows, will he be wise or a fool? Yet he will have control over all the results of my hard work, for which I work so hard and so wisely under the sun. This too is vapor that vanishes. So I changed my course, and my heart began to despair over all my hard work at which I worked so hard under the sun. Sure, there may be a man who has worked hard, wisely, aptly, and skillfully, but he must hand over whatever he accumulated by all his hard work to a man who has not worked hard for it. This too is vapor. It's so unfair. For what does a man gain through all his hard work, through all the turmoil of his heart, as he works so hard under the sun? Pain fills all his days, his occupation, his frustration. Even at night his heart does not rest. This too is vapor. There's nothing better for a man than to eat and to drink, to find joy in his work. This too, I saw, is from God's hand. For who can eat or enjoy himself apart from him? Yes, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness to the man whom he considers good. But to the person who goes on sinning, God gives the task of gathering and collecting, but only so that he can give it to a, to a person whom God considers good. This too is vapor, nothing but chasing the wind. So far the first lesson. We'll now join in singing Psalm of the Day, Psalm 90. It's, we're going to sing it according to what is printed in the red hymnal. You do not have that, so the words will appear on the screen. <laughs>
for this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3. Therefore, because you were raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death whatever is worldly in you, sexual immorality, uncleanness, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. It is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming to the, on the sons of disobedience. You too once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now you too are to rid yourselves of all these wrath, anger, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to each other since you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is continually being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but rather Christ is all and is in all. So far the epistle found in the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man who appointed me to be a judge or an arbitrator over you. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on guard against all greed, because a man's life is not measured by how many possessions he has. He told them a parable. The land of a certain rich man produced very well. He was thinking to himself, what will I do? Because I do not have anywhere to store my crops. He said, this is what I will do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and goods. And I will tell my soul, soul, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, be merry. God said to him, you fool. This night your soul will be demanded from you. Now who will get what you have prepared? This is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So far the Gospel reading.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning is the gospel lesson of the day. Take from Luke chapter 12. Someone from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man who appointed me to be a judge or an arbitrator over you. Then he said to them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because a man's life is not measured by how many possessions he has. He told them a parable. The land of a certain rich man produced very well. He was thinking to himself, what will I do because I do not have anywhere to store my crops? He said, this is what I will do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store all my green and goods. And I will tell my soul, soul, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be demanded from you. Now you will get what you have prepared. That is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In the name of our risen and ascended Lord, dear children of God, there's a trick that I think every human being falls into at least once in their life and probably many more times. And it's the idea that if I have this one thing, if somehow I can work at that, I can gain possession of this one thing, then life will be great. Life will be so much easier to live. I will be happy. And then we get it. And we find out that life hasn't changed. And what we now have is a new possession that we are going to worry about, protect, and finally it too is going to get old and thrown in the corner. Much like riches, it is said about water that it will quench your thirst, but it will not quench your thirst for more. Jesus talks to us this morning about being rich, but not the kind of rich that our world immediately thinks about. Jesus is going to talk to us about the truly rich life. A life that does not consist in what you can place in your hand, but a life that consists in whose hand your life sits. Now, two men approach Jesus, and Jesus is asked to be the arbitrator between them, and probably some argument they're having about inheritance. And I imagine Jesus was approached these kinds of things quite a bit. He was known to be a a very intelligent, smart guy. He is God. And as God, he knows what's going on in the hearts of these two men. And so he goes right at the problem. And he goes right at the problem by telling them a parable. A parable that is going to teach them and each one of us a lesson. It says there was a man, a wealthy man, who looked out on his fields and said, boy, am I going to have a good harvest this year. And as we think of this man, we, we don't, can't think of him as a bad guy. He, he had wealth, and, and maybe he worked very hard year after year after year to have this wealth. But he had a problem. God had given him so much that he wasn't quite sure what to do with it. And so I know what I'll do. I'm going to build some barns. I'm going to build stuff here on this earth for all this earthly wealth that I now have. And that'll fix the map. Now we might think of this man and say, boy, he had it made. If only we could have such problems. But before we begin to envy him too much, 
Let's look at our own lives. Now it varies from person to person and family to family, but we have to admit that God has blessed us too. Maybe he has made investments grow. Maybe he has given you a, a really good job. Or maybe very close to the parable, you have been looking out at your field and saying, boy, it's going to be a really good year this year. In varying degrees, but God has blessed us too. And maybe, maybe you have been thinking about your storage facilities. You know, we ought to really look into that money market and make sure that we're, we're doing this right. We should make sure that our retirement is set in the right places so that we can get it out. You know, maybe we do need a bigger house because we're running out of room. Maybe we need a bigger storage shed or barn. See, God has blessed us with so much that... We're not very far from what this man is going through. He has showered upon us so many blessings in this life, especially in this country. And we don't even think about how much, let's say, storage place and places we have. Just think of the, the closets full of clothing the refrigerators, the freezers, the garages, the sheds in the back. Yes, we find ourselves standing pretty close to this man as he wonders, what am I going to do? And now Jesus, as he sets up the story, allows us to go deeper. Because as always, God is always more interested in the heart. Again, make no mistake about it. There's, there's nowhere in the Bible that it says it's wrong to be rich. Okay? Everything that you have, whether you're poor or you consider yourself poor or rich, has been given to you by God. It is all a blessing. God, and while He is interested in all that He has given you, God is more interested... And what's going on in here and in here? And Jesus now takes us and he allows us to hear the thoughts of this man. And as we listen to his thoughts, we begin to understand the heart. Jesus tells us, the man says to himself, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And notice this man's thoughts don't go any farther than his barns, than, than this world. There's, there's no mention of God here. There's no mention of God's will. He's really all about enjoying what has been given to him, really to the detriment of his future because now he says to himself you know you've reached the goal of your life to become rich and we all know that every rich person is always is happy always has everything they want his confidence his joy were, was tied up with the things of this world And Jesus says, all that joy, all that confidence is now going to be taken away. We live in a very materialistic world. And we're foolish to think it doesn't affect us at all. Commercials on TV and, and the radio are screaming at you that if you're really somebody who drive this kind of car, if you're truly going to be happy, you eat this kind of food. If, if you're really going to have a solid future, you have to invest with this company. Just think right now how our 
the mood of our country is going up and down with how the stock market is. And we all have a sinful nature. A sinful nature that is pulling at us, trying to say, oh, this is what would really make you happy. This is really what it's all about. Yeah, you have to have these things in order to be happy on this earth. And we too can find ourselves pursuing the things of this world to the destruction, the detriment of the next. And so we need to be careful. We are not immune to the pressures of wanting to be rich, wanting to find our joy and our delight and what we can place in our hand. Think about it, this, this world, reading this, would praise this guy, wouldn't he? He had it made. In another portion of Scripture, Jesus points out that even if this man had everything, there was one thing in this world he could not purchase. No matter how hard he tried. Jesus once asked, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? See, had he found his, his delight, his confidence in the things of this world, and Jesus said that very night everything's going to be taken away he's going to die and everything that he now had accumulated none of it can go with him oh he might pack his casket full of money and whatever else but it's not it's not going where he's going It's all staying here. And as we heard Solomon, in a matter of speaking, whine about, who knows who gets it now? This man's joy, this man's delight is handed, in a matter of speaking, to the next generation. And what was to give him joy and delight. What was, what was really in his mind going to give him a solid future? Destroyed his future. See, a truly rich life, as Jesus makes us see, does not consist in what we can place in our hand. A truly rich life consists in whose hand our life sits. Because it's interesting how Jesus talks about this man's death. He says, this man's life will be demanded of him. That stands in stark contrast to how the death of the children of God is described throughout the Word of God. Think, think about it. Jesus committed his soul into the hands of his Father in heaven. Stephen prayed that God would receive his spirit David in Psalm 31 again talks about committing his soul to God. Abraham is gathered to his people. What's the difference? This man's joy, his delight, his confidence is going to be taken from him. He doesn't want to die. He's leaving all the good stuff behind. But the children of God in death are now going to receive their good stuff. Their joy, their delight, their confidence sits in heaven with their Savior, sits in heaven with their God. These are the children of God. These are the heirs of everything that is God. And now they step into their joy and their delight. 
You can see their riches are found in God. The Apostle Paul talked about that in our epistle lesson when he said, Therefore, because you were raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. How, how does one do that? We live here. We, we touch the things of this earth. We experience the things of this earth. We, we live and work here. God has to do it. And how he keeps our minds on things above is really what's going on here this morning. Through the word of God, he takes our minds and he reminds us of the forgiveness of sins. He reminds us of eternal life. He reminds us that we are but mortal. Through the word of God and the sacraments, he takes us and he, he points us toward heaven. And he says, there is something better, far better, that I have prepared for each one of you. See, it's God working in our hearts through word and sacrament that keeps our minds trained on the things above. That we can work and live on this earth day by day, not with our talents hooked to these things. I can't leave them. They are everything that I have, but we can use them. We can enjoy them. Because we know we have something even far better waiting for us in heaven. That's something you can't purchase. But it was purchased for you. When I talk about these kinds of things with the kids in confirmation class, I tell them, I want you now to go out and to gather every li everything you know in this world that might be worth something. And we're going to pile it in the state of Iowa. And as we pile everything in the state of Iowa, we're going to fill the state of Iowa with so many things, it's going to be six, seven, eight feet deep of all the things that we consider of any value on this earth. How many people are going to get to heaven by all those possessions? And to their credit, the kids understand. They say, no one. No one. But Jesus' blood purchased all your salvation. What you and I can't pay for. Jesus came to this earth to live and die and pay for. He did it with his life. He did it with his death. And he assures you that he didn't pay for 90% of it, telling you now you have to pay for 10. He paid for all of it. He paid the price in full for you and for me. And so we don't have to accumulate wealth on this earth thinking, well, when I get to heaven, God's going to say, well, you owe me 10000 Jesus paid your price in full. But do you see the problem? As you and I continue to live on this earth, our Father in heaven is going to continue to bless us. And he may give you a lot, he may give you a little, but he's going to continue to bless you. And so our dilemma is, what are we going to do with it all? We really don't need it for the most important thing, do we? That's paid for. Well, your Father in heaven gives it to you so you can enjoy it. He wants you to enjoy it. He wants you to have a great life here on this earth. But he doesn't want this life to ruin the next. 
He doesn't want all his blessings to suddenly become a curse. Because we can't keep things straight in our heads and in our hearts. He doesn't want us to sit back and say, Oh, yeah, eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy this world. Put your talons in it and, and, and don't let go. No, God says, no, enjoy it. But hold on to it loosely. Because I have something far better for you. It's with me in heaven. So look at what God has given to you and first of all, praise and thank Him for it. But then ask yourself, how can I use this for my eternal good? And maybe even above that, ask yourself, how can I use this for someone else's eternal good? That we can enjoy this life and look forward with full confidence and joy to the next. It's a struggle. It's a fight we all go through with the sinful nature inside of us. But staying close to your Savior in His Word and Sacrament, He helps you struggle. He continually shows us what's important what's not that important. He continually points us to heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, <coughs> under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we bring the offering forward to place on the altar, and we'll continue with the prayer. We come, O Savior, to your throne to give you of our treasure. Moved by your love, which on the cross was given without measure. Your love for us, paid out in blood, purchased our salvation. Help then our love reflect your love till we live with you in heaven. Amen. And we pray. O Lord God, we thank you for the wondrous gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, and for the promised graces we have received through him. We thank you that through his perfect life and his obedience to death on the cross, we have been granted cleansing and pardon for all our sins. We thank you that in his resurrection we have the promise of life everlasting, and that in his ascension to the right hand of your majesty, we have the assurance that he continually intercedes for us. Help us believe and trust in him, love and serve him, that in all our thoughts, words, and actions we may manifest his spirit, Rebuke our selfishness and subdue our self-indulgence. Deepen our sympathies, strengthen our hope, and confirm us in our faith. Dwell in our homes, O Lord, and let the trust of our families be centered in you alone, so that no difficult trial or adversity rob us of the conviction that you are our helper in every time of need. Relieve the afflictions of the weary and the sick, and dry the tears of the troubled and sorrowful. <coughs> Lead them to look to you as the unfailing spring of healing and hope. <clears throat> Lord God, our creator and preserver, you have given us material wealth far more than we require for our basic needs. Preserve us from apathy, complacency, and selfishness. 
keep us from so avidly pursuing prosperity that in gaining the world we lose our souls. Lead us to use wisely and for your glory the things you have entrusted to our care. Make us always grateful for your generosity and move us to share generously with others. Lord of love, we remember in our prayers the family of Karen Rue, the sister of Kathy Ruprecht, who has been taken from them by death. We ask that you would give them the strength they need in this time of grief and comfort them with the assurance of your love for them in Christ Jesus. Lead all of us to use the time you have given us to grow in our knowledge of you and your word. And when you summon us, may we be found in sincere repentance and steadfast faith, prepared to stand before your judgment seat through the merits and righteousness of Jesus our Savior. Open our eyes to see the spiritual dangers facing those who do not yet trust you as Savior and Lord, and move us to share with them the hope of an ending life we have in you. Go with us into our world and support us in all that we do to your glory. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
We pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
Hello, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. We've all heard the media reports about recent college graduates settled with enormous debt. It's true that the cost of delivering a quality education is increasing, but it's also true that Martin Luther College has a laser-like focus on affordability. Here's a common scenario. A young person is considering a career in full-time ministry, but they're not quite sure. They'd like to try Martin Luther College to test the waters, but they fear running up debt from tuition and fees. To alleviate that concern, in partnership with incoming students and their families, MLC has set a goal that no student will need to take on loans for that first year of college. It's so important that young people who are willing to consider ministry are not discouraged from pursuing that goal because studying at MLC is too costly for them. Don't forget that the public ministry is a way to make an eternal difference in the lives of people every day. We're talking about things that will make a difference forever. Uh, and that, to keep that in front of them too, so they don't just get paralyzed thinking about dollars and cents. The plan is part of a larger effort at MLC to create an appealing, yet affordable, campus experience that will attract the next generation of young people considering full-time ministry. Right now, I'm planning on MLC um, as a teacher track. I would really like to teach music or maybe elementary. I haven't decided exactly. That'd be really nice. I wanted to be a teacher. Like there was, that was like the only thing I wanted to do was I wanted to teach little kids about God's word and help them get where I am now. Taking on some college debt isn't necessarily a bad thing for a college student. The key is to keep it manageable. That's why MLC is focused on ensuring the total debt of its students stays below a level that's 50% of the average starting salary of a Wells teacher. It's a reachable goal if we all share in the effort. Parents, students, and members and congregations. I do not think we can overestimate the importance of this place. We want the gospel to live on, not only for us, but our children and our grandchildren, and for those surrounding us in our communities and world. Another key part of the effort is financial education for the students themselves. Nearly all MLC students now receive a financial wellness training to learn about budgeting and balance sheets, to prepare for their personal lives and their roles as church leaders. That's huge asset to be able to have a program that talks about these things, um, breaks it down into simple steps, and makes it approachable. Why wouldn't you want your kid to have that kind of experience as well? Nearly every college and university faces financial challenges, but Martin Luther College is dedicated to minimizing the debt of our students so they can focus on lives of service for your congregation and the world. One of the ways that our church body is helping Martin Luther College provide tuition assistance funds is through the Wells Martin Luther College Endowment, which distributes over $125,000 per year. To learn more about offering gifts for tuition assistance at MLC, contact mcg at wells.net.